Hello, my friend. Glad to see you made it here today. Because as always, we have gathered here in the name of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. He's alive, he lives. I have a wonderful little teaching today I wanna to talk about. And, and maybe you can use some of these teachings and instructions within your own life to help you with some of the relationships you have going on there in your world. I think that's one of the things we, we, we gain from knowledge of God. We gain from our knowledge and wisdom that comes through the word of God is how to be a part of a functioning relationship with other people, you know. It, it, it gives us the skills to be able to tend to the needs of those whom we care about, who we love. These are all teachings and, and instructions given to us because we, we are imperfect people. We fail, we fall short, we we do things that we know we ought not to do. And what do we do when we find ourselves doing the things we know we ought not to do? <laughs> so this, these teachings today are good for fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, friends, brothers and sisters, whoever we may be, children. We are all children of the Most High God. And we're learning how to live with God. God being represented here on earth as the Holy Spirit and through the Holy Spirit. So we must come to recognize God. And I, and I think that's in all of it, that's what we're, we're doing. We're, we're wrestling with God. The, the wrestle, the fight is not against flesh and blood. Keep that in mind. But, but the, the, the wrestle, the fight is against us and, and the Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit is absolute truth. <laughs> if you want to be a part of a functioning good relationship with other people, you, you must allow room for the Holy Spirit in your lives. The Holy Spirit in, in our lives or actively living in, in our lives is seen through 
our willingness to obey his instructions. We must learn to forgive. And if we, we've made a mistake within our relationships, we've made mistakes within our lives, we, we, we must say and ask for forgiveness. Sometimes just following the instructions of God is extremely powerful. We, we don't know what to do, but what we can do is trust in God's teachings, which might be to ask for forgiveness, might be to, to obey the things God asks us to obey too. And, and so I want to come to 1 Samuel and, and we'll just tell you the story of, of chapters 15. And, and most of our teachings today is going to come through chapter 16, 1 Samuel. This is God's relationship with Saul and God's relationship with David and how God interacts, interacts with both David and Saul. Saul, we see in chapter 15, it is one, he has been anointed by God to be king of Israel and this was a request of the people, right? The people, said they were tired of being ruled over by God or being God governed. And they said, we want a king just like everyone else. So <clears throat> the love of the world, the, the desire to be just like the world and everyone else makes us enemies to God. That's what we're learning in this story. I, I listened to men instead of the will of God. That's another thing we're listening, learning in this story. That listening to men, the people of this world, people who are not living rightly with God, can lead us down paths of destruction, pain, suffering, broken relationships. The people of Israel always wanted to offer God burnt offerings and sacrifices for their sins, for their wrongdoings, for their failures. But God truly wanted their obedience. He wanted them to obey. And, and Moses, and throughout the Torah, says the same thing. God does not desire sacrifice, but instead and desires obedience you'll find the blessing inside of your obedience you're not going to find the blessing inside of, of sacrifice and burnt offerings because the sacrifice and the burnt offerings are an admission to the sin admission to the failure the error the wrongdoing but god truly desires obedience. There's no sin, there's no error, there's no failure, there's no wrongdoing inside of the obedience. Well, whatever God commands us to do, and at this time, as we see in chapter 15, God commands through Samuel to Saul that he must kill all the Amalekites, Amalekites, not to leave any alive, kill every man, woman, child, and their animals. Nothing is to be left. Kill it all, put all of it to death. Now, we could see these people being humans, whatever God commands us to do, we, we obey that command, no matter what it is. In this day, he, he commands them to put death to all the Amalekites. And we, we could look at that in, in our world, is our, again, our fight isn't against flesh and blood or other people. The fight is against the principality and the rulers 
in dark places or in heavenly realms, in, in the unseen places. So our, our sin, our rebellion, our wrongdoings, putting death to those things. I, I know what I ought to do, but I keep doing all the things I should not do. <laughs> putting, putting death to that and bringing to life Obedience. Obedience. So Saul goes out and he kills all the Amalekites. Kills them all, but the king saves the king and does not destroy the animals. Instead, keeps the animals alive, brings them with it, and as plunder, right? As a reward. But later, tells Samuel, you know, oh, we, we saved the animals as a burnt offering, a sacrifice. Samuel told Saul to wait, wait for my return. Wait for me. So, so again, we, we see Saul is full of rebellion. He, he half-heartedly follows the commands. He somewhat followed the commands, but not fully followed the commands. And then he, he gets tired of waiting for Saul, and, and he gives in to the commands of man. So, just a, a, as Saul rejected the commandments of, of God, the, the people rejected God to rule over them, and then God gave to them what they wanted, did the exact 100% opposite of everything he was. And then later rejects Saul in the same way the people rejected him. So, so God, by the, according to the measure they used, he measured it back to them. And, and they all found themselves in a place of suffering and despair. God, being willing to lay down his life for the protection of his people, then placed for them a king at their choice who, who desired for the people to lay down their lives for the protection of the king. The exact opposite of everything God was. No longer was there a king who was willing to protect the people. Instead, the people were expected to protect the king even at the cost of their own blood, their own children, their own lives. Saul gets tired of waiting for Samuel. And so he offers a burnt sacrifice, a burnt offering. Samuel shows up, and what have you done? What are you doing? Because of your rebellion, God is now going to tear away the kingdom from you. He's going to give it to another. And that's everything the people said. They wanted to tear themselves away from God and and allow some other to rule over them. Not God. Samuel was upset about it. He, he felt it as they were rejecting him because he was like the last prophet. A man who, who came and, and brought them God's word and, and understanding. And, and through him, they had a connection to God. But God said to Samuel, don't worry, don't, don't. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me, the word that speaks through you. In the beginning, God is the word. He was the word. And the word was with God. Samuel says, because of your rebellion, God 
is going to reject you because you've rejected the commandments of God. Now God rejects you. He's going to give to another the kingdom, to one of your neighbors, not any of your seed, your sons, or your daughters, or any of that, but to a neighbor. Saul says, I, I have sinned. I, I, I should have followed the commandments fully. I, I should have, uh, have obeyed every tittle and jot and diddle of the word, no matter what it was. I should have obeyed it. And Samuel says, you know, rebellion against God's commands is no different than witchcraft or div divination. You're, you're trying to make yourself above the word of God, above the commandment of God, trying to make yourself God. Nobody is above God. Nobody is above the commandments of God. You, you do wrong, and, and there's always going to come the repercussions of that wrong. <laughs> Every action, whether it's negative or positive, is going to be responded by with the reaction. And, and, and these things trickle down right into our, our very families and our relationships. So, so what we have to do, what we can do, is trust in God and in God's teachings. Obey God. And, and in that, we can repair relationships. We, we can be a part of healthy, sustainable relationships. We, as God commands us, forgive and ask for forgiveness. Yes, asking for forgiveness, asking the burnt sacrifice, the burnt offerings are a, a, an ask or an atonement for the forgiveness of sins or, or the wrongdoings, and yet you're, you're never going to find the blessing in that. You're always going to find the blessing in the obedience, peace within your relationships and your homes and your families is always going to come through your willingness to obey. But God does allow forgiveness and does encourage forgiveness. So ask. Ask for forgiveness, and surely you will receive that forgiveness. Seek to do right. And surely God will reward you with goodness, with righteousness. Samuel says to Saul, Has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. What about king of your own home? I mean, yeah, well, yeah. We're, we're in this story. We're talking about Saul, but what about what if we were talking about you, whoever you may be? What if we we're talking about me, being king of our own home, king of our own family, and king of a relationship? And we've hurt and we violate somebody by doing some wrong. And then all of a sudden they reject us as being king of our home, king of our family, king of the relationship. I don't want to be 
in your presence any longer. And, and what are we going to do? Psalm, Saul begged Samuel to, for forgiveness, forgive me. And Samuel says, there, there's nothing I can do. God has rejected you. He's going to give the kingdom to another. And, and so he leaves, and Saul grabs hold of, of his garment, his, his clothing, and it tears. Samuel looks back, just as you have torn my clothing, so the Lord our God has torn away from you the kingdom of Israel. And then the Spirit of God left Saul. Saul was full of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of, the Spirit of God. And, and when he was full of the Holy Spirit, he was able to do many things, all things. Nothing was impossible for him. The only thing that prevented him from doing anything was rebellion of heart. Rebellion. His own desires not to follow the teachings, the commandments, or the instructions of God. And then that removal of the Holy Spirit was replaced with an evil spirit, a spirit of depression, a spirit of feeling unworthy, a spirit of feeling worthless. And when the evil spirit came upon him, he couldn't do anything. That's why when we see in chapter 17 of the story, you know, even him being the leader of the entire nation of Israel, they, they could not engage in the battle against the Philistines. A, a group of uncircumcised people, and, and when it's saying uh, uncircumcised people, people who were outside of the protection of God. They, they were powerless. The, the entire nation of them. Nobody could do anything, and, and that's that's separation of God and man. That, that's for all of us, even to this day. If, if we don't have the Holy Spirit within us and over us and around us, we lose our ability to do anything. We can't even be a, a functioning king, king of our home, king of our families, king of a nation, king of anything. We are hopeless and helpless and in a place of fear. Fear. Sometimes the one things that are the things that create fear within us, especially when we're dealing with relationships, is having to admit I, I made a mistake having to admit uh, I misunderstood, having to admit I did wrong. And, and in that, we're afraid. I'm afraid to ask for forgiveness because in asking for forgiveness, I, I have to admit first I, I did something wrong. But God says, trust in me, trust in my teachings, trust in my instructions. And, and no matter what in life comes your way, nothing is impossible for those who trust in the Lord. We can overcome any situation. We can cut, overcome any sense of, of disappointment. 
Trust in the Lord. Trust and obey in the commandments of God. For, for those who trust, nothing is impossible. And, that, and that's <clears throat> the thing with David. Samuel then goes out and, and finds the next king. And he goes to Jesse as according to the commandments of God. And he looks through all of his sons, seven sons, David being the eighth of the seven. Looks at the big one, looks at the biggest one, looks at the medium one. <laughs> But God says, don't look upon the stature of man. It's not, not has nothing to do with the physical appearance. Saul was head and shoulders above everyone of, in his nation. He was a big man, a large man. He had all the muscles. He had all the, the might and the size. But inwardly, Saul felt as though he was small. He was unworthy and, and he wasn't up for the task. He, he, he struggled with that all throughout his life. He needed other people to support him. He, he needed men to validate him. That's why he gave in to the pressures of men instead of that of the unseen God. He was, in essence, a, a narcissist. He cared about himself and only himself and his image. When God called him to be king, he, he was found hiding. He was hiding himself. And he had, st by stature, he, he was the biggest and strongest of them all. But inwardly, he felt small. Now, David was small in stature and in fact, he was a young man. He's not even a grown man. The youngest of his family. The smallest of his family. But he was good looking. And he was intelligent. And he, he was a musician. He could play the, the lyre or the harp and sing and things of that nature. Right? He wasn't the captain of the football team. Saul is like captain of the football team. David is a member of the band. But in that, he knew how to tend to the needs of the things his father saw as important, like the sheep, the flock. And so when Samuel came in, David's out there with the sheep, tending to their needs, taking care of them, protecting over them. Samuel finally meets David and this is the one. This is the one who has a heart for God. It's all about the spirit of the man and his willingness to obey God. The Holy Spirit came upon David, and, and David was full of the Holy Spirit. And then, <clears throat> first task. <laughs> the first task of David, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, was to do what? Go and tend to the needs of Saul. This man who had been rejected by God, who had been separated from God, but God didn't necessarily utterly forsake Saul. He never left Saul. Instead, he, he presented himself to Saul through David, a man who had a heart for God, who was full of the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't you think God, even now in our lives, is calling us to have a heart for him? Doesn't God, even now in our lives, desire for us to be like David? That, that's why there's the complete and entire story of David. It's one of the most 
complete stories in the Bible of a person and not just the nation, but, but of an individual. If there's an individual within the Bible that God wants us to be like, he wants us to be like David. He wants us to be like Christ. In David being anointed by God, the anointed one, the, that's another word, is Messiah. God revealed himself to Saul through David, but it was the hardening of Saul's heart that that rebellion within his heart, he not only rejected God, he, he rejected David as well, but David refused to reject Saul, seeing that, that Saul was anointed by God. Whether Saul was doing right or doing wrong, he, he still was anointed by God, and yet David wanted Saul to know the love of God. And that's Jesus in our lives as well. He, he wants us to know the love of God. He wants to reconcile the lost, the rebellious to himself through his anointed, through the works of his beloved That's it's no different than our world today. It's no different than our, than our lives today. So every time Saul had, had this bad spirit come upon him, this, this, this spirit of, you know, depression upon him, David was asked to, to enter into the room and, and do what? Play the harp for him. to praise and worship God. And our worship for God is what? Going to church and singing songs like David? No, or the, the part of, in the story that we should see is David being the living sacrifice, giving himself as a sacrifice. So, so the first task God commands on David is to tend to Saul's needs. Love those who will not love you back. Being a, a, a living sacrifice to those who have rebelled or can't see the goodness of God. Can't see or recognize or understand the unseen God, but if we obey the commandments of God, surely God can be seen It can be known, and, and that's the thing. God glorifies himself through his beloved children, through those who are willing to obey themselves. That's why Jesus says, you will recognize my people. You will recognize my students, my disciples, those who are studying and putting to practice my teachings and instructions by the way they love one another. They are a living sacrifice. So, so David sacrifices his time and, 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 and his happiness and his joy to Saul. And when David would be in Saul's presence, well, so where does our peace come from? The Holy Spirit. Our, the Holy Spirit is where our peace comes from. And, and David would bring peace to Saul's spirit. Now this was before Saul found out David was going to be the next king of Israel. But that's, if we're going to be king of our own home, king of our own family, king of our own relationships, then we must allow Christ in us to, to be seen, to be known. We must allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to do his thing. And the only way his thing can be done is if we're obeying his commands. If a brother 
or sister or wife or husband has something against you, reconcile with them immediately. Go and reconcile with them. Immediately go and say, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I, 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 I'm able to think about it. I'm able to understand and recognize what I did was wrong. Whatever it may have been, I need your forgiveness. And it's not that I need it in order for me to function and be happy. I need your forgiveness so I may see peace within your own heart so, so that we can reconcile and move forward within our own relationship. And, and, it's, and it's not, you know, I, I want to surrender to my bad spirit, surrender to my wrongdoing, my rebellion. No, I, I want you to surrender to the presence of the Holy Spirit, which brings peace, peace to our homes, peace to our relationships, peace to our families. And in that, we, we will find joy together. Find joy together. The Lord says in chapter 16, verse 7, do not look on his appearance or on his height of his stature because I have rejected him for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart, on the heart. So if the, the Lord is present within your spouse, your friend, your mother, your father, your husbands or your wives is going to respond to the heart. And God is present. God is present. He's always present within the believers. And nothing is impossible, right? David comes in chapter 17 at the command of his father, and his father was what? Worried for his brothers. As they had a couple of brothers in the army following after Saul. Send to them some bread and some cheese and some fruit and, and some good things. Here, here's the reward. And the reward came with David, a man full of the Holy Spirit. And David sees and hears of Goliath coming out and tormenting everyone, and everyone is seized or frozen, and stuck in fear that they have a king ruling over them who has no connection with God. It is nothing is impossible. Even if you have the army of an entire kingdom at your disposal, nothing is impossible. Nothing. But soon as a man who comes full of the Holy Spirit enters into the situation, even if he doesn't have one soldier at his disposal, he only has God. Nothing is impossible for that man. Nothing. Didn't need to enter, engage into the battle with, with even a weapon of war or protection for his body. Saul <coughs> tried to dress David with his own gear, his, his own armor. David, I, I, I cannot engage in the battle with, with your armor, the things that you have chosen to protect you, and, and what did Saul use to protect him? The opinions of other people. And it's that, that, that 
opinions of other people that usually prevent us from saying, you know, I, I did wrong. I made a mistake. There's one thing, uh, narcissistic people, and narcissistic people are people who are inwardly very, they lack confidence, they, they lack self-assurance. They, they're, they're small inside. And so they, they live and they feed off the opinions of other people. So they can never be wrong. And they can never admit they've done wrong. Because they're, 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 their wall of protection is in them always being right. Them always portraying themselves as perfect. But it's not of an outer appearance. People who are, who are narcissistic are always seeking to, to display the perfection of themselves in, in, in this outer appearance. But e even in that, that, they can do nothing. And nothing is possible for them. But for those who are vulnerable, that their protection is within themselves. They, they have a sense of, of confidence that they're able to be vulnerable in the, in the sight of others and the, the, the opinions of others doesn't really matter. And, and that's why David is able to come into to a nation that was seized in fear and a lack of confidence, says to his brothers and them, why, why aren't you guys engaging in, into the battle? Hey, you come down here looking for evil. You, you just want to see the shedding of blood. You, you just want to see us harmed. We don't get in the battle because we, we might be hurt. How dare you try and goad us into the battle? Bad, bad boy. Go back home to dad and tend to the needs of the sheep. And he says to another and another, why, why aren't you guys engaging in the battle? And, and they're frozen, stuck, and seized in, in fear. We, we can't do anything. Nothing's possible for us. David, who has a sense of confidence within himself, doesn't care what everybody else thinks. And, and, and he doesn't need any of them. He has everything he needs within the Holy Spirit, within God. He engages in, in the battle, takes with him five smooth stones and Maybe those five smooth stones are represented in, in, in the five books of Moses, the, the Torah, and the teachings and instructions of the Torah. It, it is better to obey. It is better to trust in God than to trust in men. It is better to trust in God than it is to trust in princes. And those five smooth stones came from the teachings and instructions of God, which he was willing to obey. Because in the obedience to God's commands, we find the blessings. Engages in the battle, and nothing is impossible for him. The Philistine comes and and Goliath the giant mocks David by the power of his own gods, which were no gods at all. I come with my shield bearer. I, I come in the might of my javelin and my sword and, and my armor. David says, you may very well have, but I come in the name of Yahweh.
I come in the name of the Lord. On this day, I will cut off your head, your body, and the bodies of all the Philistine will be fed to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. I want you to know, the Lord wants you to know, the Lord wants all these people to know. Not only is there a God on earth, there's a God on earth that walks with Israel and he delivers his people, not by the power of the sword, but by the power of his spirit, of his spirit. Now, we come all the way here to Romans chapter 12, and all this wraps up into this as Paul, a Pharisee, a person who has dedicated his entire life to the study of the Torah and the Old Testament, and then also has dedicated his life to Jesus Christ. A man full of the Holy Spirit, speaking by the Spirit, through the Spirit, revealing and unveiling to us the answer to our problems. <laughs> and this is what he says. Chapter 12. I appeal, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So when David came with, with the lyre or the harp and, and would play the music, it's not about singing to God. The spiritual worship was and is being the living sacrifice. And he goes on to say, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. By the testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought. Uh, to think, but to think with a sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. We, we see all of this being displayed right there in chapters 15, 16, and 17 of 1 Samuel. All of this right here being displayed there in that story. And that's why we should read the Bible. That's why we should be in the Word of God. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Adore what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be consistent in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Again, everything Paul speaks of right here can be seen as a living example of everything going on there in 15, 16, and 17 of 1 Samuel. All of it. And 
That's what I'm saying. Are, are you the king of your own home? Are you the king of your own castle? Are you the king of your own relationships, your families? The only way you can be a good king within your relationships, your families, is by allowing the Holy Spirit to reign in the midst of it. Trust in the Lord. Trust in, in, in his teachings and his instructions. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless. Do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And we see David obeying all the instructions of God. David, a man who had the heart for God. God says it is through David. I, I desire to display my glory, display myself. Two times Saul had been handed over to David. God placed the life of Saul in David's hand. And, and Saul spent his whole life seeking to destroy David. <laughs> he was the persecutor of, of David. And both times when, when God delivered Saul in, in, into the hand of David, David spared his life. I will not be overcome by evil, but instead I will show you good. I will show you mercy. I want you to know God loves you. He said, God has given me the power to destroy you, but I spare your life so you would understand and see and recognize the mercy of God. And in the same way, when our relationships and our dealings with our families and our communities, co-workers, husbands, wives, whatever it may be, dealing with our children, forgive and ask for forgiveness. There's, there's power in that. There is great power in the forgiveness of sin, love, does cover over a multitude of sins. There's great power in sometimes admitting you've done wrong and you need forgiveness. And there's great joy and rejoicing when all the teachings and instructions of God come together. Joy, life, rejoicing. That, that spirit of depression, that spirit of worthlessness, it all dissipates and it all goes away. It will disappear because there's nothing impossible for those who obey. <laughs>